then we always get the ones that are missing deductions. But it's only on the tax bill. So they can read it. It's just right there. But they don't worry about that until. How aggressive are we on homestead violators these days? Well, pretty, pretty much. All right. We just had a couple more eligible homesteads that she sent out just in the last month. The last couple weeks. I mean, I know there was a big rush years ago when they first. Well, you know, yeah, this, because we had SRI do that for us then. My name is Scott Murphy, and I'm a county auditor. I was elected last November and started um, my term in January. Prior to that, I was five years as chief deputy auditor, and then 10 years prior to that as deputy controller and city controller for the city of South Bend. So. Can you do a speaker, please? We can't hear you. Oh. Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. I don't know if we brought the mic or not, but can you do it this way? Does that work? Okay. Uh, my name is John Murphy, and I'm the uh, auditor for St. Joseph County. Um, prior to that, I worked as five years as chief deputy auditor for the county, and prior to that, I worked ten years as uh, deputy auditor and or deputy controller and city controller for the city of South Bend. Karen uh, White, uh, council member Karen White, approached me about a month or so ago with an idea to have a property tax kind of summit introduction, not a partisan event, just kind of a sharing of information. Um, there have been some increased assessments and so forth, and we know that citizens are interested in how all of this works. So that's what we kind of put together here. Um, I wanted to thank a couple of people for helping. For, before I introduce the speakers, I wanted to help a, um, thank a couple of people for helping set this up. Jen Prewat, who is in the back, helped with the audio and getting that all set up. Um, Shannon Shark and Amber King from the assessor's office also helped put this together. So we're, we appreciate that. Our first speaker will be, and I'll introduce all the speakers and then they can do their thing. Karen White, uh, council member for the city of South Bend, I think t 16 years, or at least, I think. More than that, okay. Um, we'll give some remarks and uh, we'll introduce other officials in the audience. Mike Castellan, the county assessor, will um, discuss property tax assessments and appeals. Mike is newly elected newly elected as county assessor, but prior to that he worked for many years as the Penn Township assessor. He has a lot of good information. I find out he's a, a really good friend of my brother Steve's, so he's, he's got to be a good guy. <laughs> Kathy Gregorich from our office will talk about property tax exemptions and deductions. That's the other side of the property tax bill that maybe you don't quite understand, but she'll go through all that. She's worked for a number of years, starting in 2008 in the auditor's office, and is really one of the most important people that we have um, in our office. And hiding back in the last row, we have Morella Carmona and Patty Henry. Patty was with the auditor's office for a number of years, I think maybe 24 years, and uh, recently uh, went to work with Mike in the assessor's office, so we're really happy for her. And then Morella does such a great job in, in our office, so we're pleased to have her in, our, in attendance. And then finally, we're gonna end up with uh, Steve Dalton from, from Sender Dalton Municipal Advisors, gonna talk about circuit breaker and, and overlapping property tax rate. Uh, Steve is more than a financial advisor to the county. He's very integral um, to our, our budgeting and many of our factions. He's a really uh, good guy. I met him in 2007 when I started with the county. And kind of that year, we had a situation where we had our former um, deputy auditor was, was ill, so Steve kind of carried the, did the, kind of carried the whole budget on his back. The 2018 budget probably would not have happened without Steve's help, so we owe him a debt of gratitude for that. <laughs> And um, finally, we'll end up with questions. So if you could save questions for after the presentations, I think that might move uh, smoothly. So Karen, what, you wanna take it over? I don't know I'm gonna be taking it over, but I'm just going to first of all, thank you, Mr. Murphy, for accepting uh, the invitation that when we met 
and you, you're correct. It was about maybe three to four weeks ago. I approached Mr. Murphy and said, let's do an informational session on property taxes because there's a lot of information and that information is very overwhelming. And uh, to begin to share with our citizens, I would like to thank those that are in the audience and there are some who's joined us virtually to really um, receive this information. It is a lot of information, but it's good information. I really appreciate you giving the opportunity for our citizens, one, to receive the information, but also have opportunity to ask questions. I don't know uh, if the other um, common council members are virtually. I do know that some will be joining us uh, very shortly. And we'd like to have all the, the county commissioners and uh, others to stand because I don't want to leave anyone out. So if you would stand and share your name. And I really appreciate you being here as well. This shows for me that we can work together. And I think so it's so important as we begin to look at the issues that our city, our county, and also our citizens, that they see that we can come together and have a good conversation. So I'm gonna turn it over to the chair. Is there anyone else? Well, again, Mr. Murphy, thank you. We do have a representative from the South Bend Community School representative that's here, and that's Mr. Ramon Johnson. Thank you so much, and let's get ready for Property Tax 101. I'll turn it back into your hands. Councilor White, this is President McBride. I am virtual. I was going to come inside, but I'm virtual, as well as uh, Councilor uh, Canifley. Okay, so first, my name is Michael Caslon. I am your uh, county assessor, and I want to thank uh, Ms. Karen White for putting this together. I think it's a great opportunity to, for us to uh, ask questions and provide information to the public because the tax assessment process is complicated, and, and it's not lost on me as your assessor that it, you know it hits you in the pocketbook and, and really is, is a sore point for some people. So I, I do want to. Uh, today give you some of the information that can make the process easier for you and then answer questions on the back end when everybody's done pres uh, doing their presentations so that we can uh, uh, get you those answers that you, you really uh, came here to get. Um, so with that said, um, I, uh, as John had said, uh, I just was newly elected as the county assessor, but I spent, did spend uh, three terms as your township assessor. Uh, prior to that, uh, I worked for the, the United States Navy uh, for 20 years, and then that I was in the Diplomatic Corps for uh, several years as well. So um, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to speak with you guys uh, this evening. So it's not lost on me that one of the top questions we're getting is, is uh, hey, why did the property taxes raise so high? And so what you're seeing in this tax bill that you just received is an assessment from last year. And so I want to point out this this uh, this assessment that you get because it comes every year in a form in a, in a form called Form 11. So uh, I was going to see if the uh, pointer will work here for us. So I don't know if you can see this. This is the Form 11, and really th what this does is is it gives you two. I know you can't see it, but uh, you should have a form that was available to you over here. Uh, it tells you what your assessment was the previous year and what the assessment's going to be the next year. But what's really important on this is most people look at this and because it doesn't say tax bill, they throw it in the trash. And if you look in the block of the information here in big bold letters, it says if you do not agree with the assessment, you have 45 days to file your appeal. And really, this is a guideline that's set by legislation and by the state of Indiana. So if you don't meet that time frame, there's really not much I can do as your assessor. So every year, around April 27th, and this year, April 27th, we'll be sending out the new Form 11s. This gives you 45 days from the time that you receive it, the deadline being June 15th for you to file your tax appeal. So what type of things are we looking for in the tax appeal? Well, the first thing that we need to talk about is there's some responsibilities on the taxpayer themselves that would help the assessor 
uh, collect the, the data to ensure that we're, we're assessing you correctly. So each and every one of you, if you have a question about your tax bill, you should ask for a copy of your property record card. And up here you see a copy of the property record card and in, sorry, in some of the information that denotes the different information that you would need for the appeal, i.e. the tax ID number, uh, the legal description is here, the neighborhood for which it falls in, the total assessment that, that's uh, being projected for the next year, and then the other information that you could help us if we may have not got it correct. Uh, the system's not infallible, so it's really dependent on the taxpayers to help us collect the data. Uh, we can't come into your house. So if you made significant changes or changes were made when the house was bought that we can't see, this is a great opportunity for you to help us collect that information. So here we'll tell, uh, denote the type, the number of rooms, the square footage. So it's really important that you guys pull the property record cards and look at the property record card. And, and this is your opportunity through the appeal process to say, hey, look, you, you don't have it right. I only have two bathrooms, not three, or I have one fireplace. Uh, this really helps us look at the appeal process to get the information correct. So let's say we go into the appeal process and you know you, you don't agree with the assessment. What are the next steps in the appeal process? So some of the reasons that we would have uh, for the appeal is there was a recent sell um, and the sell of the property or you purchase the property and it's lower than the assessment. Typically when you buy a property, you should get uh, an appraisal, especially if you get a mortgage, the bank's going to ban you get an appraisal. Uh, this is evidence that we could use uh, to set the assessment. So it's imperative that you get that information to us in the appeal process. You can also uh, get online and pull comparable cells. And so if you find it through the county website, through your own research that the comparable cells are showing a different value, you can use that as evidence to present to the assessor's office. And then if there's issues with the property, like I was saying before, where we didn't get the data correct, the more information you can give me and my staff, the quicker we can make the assessment, the, the appeal process work for you. Uh, we're working on making some significant changes to the appeal process. We're bringing in what we call a market regression analysis program that helps us look at a more comprehensive view of the assessment process. Uh, so that we can get an understanding of what your property really is in today's market. See, the state of Indiana uses what we call market value and use. So they're really comparing you to this huge amount of homes. That may not be indicative to your particular home. So it's really imperative that we have this conversation through the appeal process in an informal meeting for us to look at the uniqueness of your property so we can get it right. So the next step then, one, if you fall within this criteria and you've looked at the, uh, um, the appeals, the next step is to file a 130 form. Uh, you can get this online, you can get this at the office here at the St. Joe County uh, building, or you can go to the Penn office and pull the 130 form. Uh, here it's looking at, if you look at a couple of some of the information here, it's looking at what was the land value what is the improvement value? What is the total value? And then what is it that you think the assessment should be? And then you have an opportunity in the appeal to provide us the evidence that we need to go forward with the appeal process. So that's the first step is the Form 130. Once you file that Form 130, it's not an instant process. So if you file it today, I can't get your a result. We have to do some research. When we're going to look at your property, we're going to make sure we have the data correct on our side, and then we're going to pull comparables to make sure we got the assessment process correct. So I do want to put to rest a, a bit of a fallacy. Uh, you have to remember we work for you. We do not work for, sorry, the rest of government. I do not work for the commissioners. I do not work for the mayors. I work for you. And so I would tell you that this the... I guess there's a rumor out there that you need to get an appraisal. Appraisals are expensive. I would tell you allow us to go through the informal process first, and then if you don't agree, then we can start talking about the cumulative you know, market analysis or appraisals. It's dependent on my staff to really do the work for you. So give us the opportunity to do the job first. 
Uh, and it's worked well in the past for us in Penn, and, and we're going to bring that here to the county. And I think uh, uh, it'll work well if you get, if you work with us with giving us the information. So once we file the form, we'll go through that process. My one of my staff members will reach out to you. They'll discuss the uh, information, and then uh, if you don't agree, then we can we can set up an informal meeting. Then the next step is if you don't agree with the informal portion of it, then we can send it to the county tax board of appeals. Once we get to the county tax board of appeals, this is really where you, you're going to have to have some you know some really good evidence uh, besides what we had talked about in an informal meeting, and then. If we don't agree at the informal or at the Peter Bullet hearing, you can obviously take it to the Indiana Board of Tax Review. But I'd like to think that we could work together to try to make this, this assessment process, you know, a lot easier, not only for us, but for you. So let me discuss just real quick why the appeal process is so important to the assessment process. For years, uh, you know, the data uh, wasn't collected probably in the way that it should be because the assessment process has changed as the state legislation has changed criteria each year as we move forward. And so the appeal process allows me to collect that data and, and then determine if there are issues in particular neighborhoods or areas we couldn't see in the normal assessment process. So going back to that mass appraisal uh, technique that we were talking about, it really looks at a, you know, a huge amount of homes and doesn't allow us the ability to look at independent homes until we get into the appeal process. So I can't impress on you uh, any more uh, how important the appeal process is and how that appeal process is your rights to ensure that the assessment process is correct. And then, there's some other things that, that we need to discuss, and, and, and that's when, when can you not uh, file appeal? Uh, so the first thing is you had to own the home January 1st of the year for which you're filing the, the, the tax. Uh, unless you paid in your agreement to buy, you paid the taxes up front. Uh, if you transferred, and we've had this scenario where individuals transfer the home amongst family members, uh, this becomes this becomes an issue because you can't apply for appeal in the same year if you already owned the home and then you're you're trying to circumvent the appeal process. Uh, and then uh, the other question would be if you're trying to fi file an appeal and obviously the sale was way above the assessment. I mean, it's really hard, it's really hard to come in and then try to lower the assessment when you paid. Fifty, sixty thousand dollars above what the assessment is. So those are uh, areas for which we might say, "Hey, you know, I don't know if we're going to have grounds to to justify an appeal." So then there's the other area in the appeal process. If you own properties, or uh, uh, you might want to help a, a significant other, like you know, an elderly uh, family member, then you must have a, a power of attorney to be able to file that appeal on their behalf. So um, power attorneys are significant because it allows you to give, to give the, to have the ability to file that appeal and it meets the guidelines by the state. So if you don't have that, we won't answer the appeal unless you have that on behalf of your significant other. And then there's the other portion of the appeal process outside of the uh, independent homes that are owned. There's the rental properties and that's a whole different uh, process. And so in the, uh, in the, um, the rental property, we develop what we call a gross rent multiplier. And it's really based off of what is, it, to keep it simple, it's really based off of uh, what is the going rent in, in the particular neighborhoods for which your rental property is in, and then um, what, are they, what would a rental property sell for in your neighborhood. So we'll be asking for, if you file an appeal in the rental portion of it or income producing property, we'll be asking for leasing information or sales information that helps us derive the gro gross rent multiplier to the assessment. I will tell you there in the past, people are reluctant to give that, but we are ordered because they're afraid that information will get out, but we're ordered by state law to protect that information. That is protected under Indiana Code 6-1 for us to protect your rental uh, information. But it is necessary for us to develop the, uh, the gross rent multipliers. And this is a particular soft spot for me because 
we want to make sure we provide correct assessments for the income producing properties because this impacts you know affordable uh, living for a lot of people in our community so the more informative as a land uh, our uh, property owner that, of rental properties, you can be with me, the more correct we can get the, uh, the assessments, which is a reflection onto the, uh, onto the people who are uh, providing those, those particular properties. So the last part of the appeal process is uh, it for us, uh, you know, it, at my level is once we go through the preliminary hearing, uh, it will go on to the county tax board appeals. And once it does, it's really out of the hands of the assessor. So I think the, the, the message here is afford the office the opportunity to do the job for you. And if you work with us, the more efficient we can be to make sure that the assessment process is correct as we move forward. So that's pretty much my presentation and I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Hi, my name is Kathy Gregorich. And I'm the office manager and settlement specialist in the auditor's office. And I've been doing this since 2011. So I've done this for a little while. Um, I thought I would start, because most people don't understand really how the property tax system works. So I thought I would just start with a real brief overview of that. So it's, because there's a lot of offices involved. So the assessor's office, of course, comes up with the assessments. They roll those values to us. We put them in the property tax system. Then in the auditor's office, it's our responsibility to apply all of the deductions that people have applied for onto their property or any exemptions that have gone through the assessor's office and been approved. Uh, once that is done, then we actually do the tax bill calculations. And then that is sent to the treasurer's office. The treasurer's office sends out the bills, collects the money, and then it's back into the auditor's office, and we do what's called settlement, which is the balancing of all the tax monies that's been, that have been collected and apportion it um, into all of the taxing districts that um, should have that money. So then we distribute the money to the schools, the libraries, um, et cetera, the way it should be by their tax rates. Um, and then just to give you an idea, because I know probably one of the biggest questions that we've had um, from since the tax bills have gone out is I appealed the assessor's office has agreed why is my tax bill the original assessed value so that's probably one of the biggest questions we get and uh, I'm just going to touch base on timing I'm not trying to give any um, I'm not trying to you know say it's it's not our fault or whatever I just want you to understand we calculated the bills the first of March so we calculated them the 1st of March, sent them to the treasurer's office, and they sent the bills out the middle of March. So if people approved, if they sent their paperwork to the assessor, let's say in February, we probably didn't get their paperwork in time to put that correction into the billing system before we calculated. Therefore, you're getting a bill based on the original assessment, and then our office is working as quickly as we can to get those corrections done and sent out. We sent out, um, I think, about 2,000 corrected bills this week, this past week. So we are trying to work on those as quickly as we can and get those corrected, because we understand everybody wants to have a corrected tax bill. So that is our priority also. Okay, then I wanted to just touch base real briefly on deductions. That was the yellow handout. It kind of explains all the different deductions that you might uh, be able to apply for and you can kind of read through that if you have specific questions I would really suggest you call our office and one of our very knowledgeable property tax clerks or supervisors can help you through to see if you um, qualify and what information we need in order to process those deductions but I did want to point out there's one um, change for next year uh, for this year the homestead deduction is still uh, 45,000 Next year, on next year's tax bill, the state has increased that to 48,000, but they have eliminated the mortgage deduction, which used to be 3,000. So if you had a homestead and a mortgage this year, the total was $48,000 deduction. Next year, it'll just be 48 on the homestead line. The mortgage deduction will be gone. 
So again, you know, look through that deduction, the yellow page, and if you have any questions on specifics, um, please call our office and someone will help you through and let you know if you do qualify and what you need to do um, to bring in so that we can get you set up. And just keep in mind, whatever you file in one year will be on the tax year, the tax bill the following year. So any deductions you file in 2023 are for 2023 taxes that will be payable in 2024. So therefore, the only thing that can, you, there's really at this point no way to correct a current tax bill unless there was a mistake. Unless you filed for a homestead and somehow it didn't get applied to your, part, your property, then be sure to notify us. We'll look into it. If that was our mistake, we definitely will get that fixed for you. But if you forgot to file last year, then you need to come in this year and file, and it'll be on your tax bill for next year. And the one thing that I, oh, one other thing about um, the tax bills. Those people that got the tax bill and your approved appeal has not been reflected yet on the tax bill. And the due date's coming up May 10th. It's coming up very shortly. And there really is no way we're going to get them all done by May 10th. I mean, we're trying our best, but um, I think we have like 2,000 of them in our office right now. So it's probably not going to happen by May 10th. So we strongly suggest, and this is what we always tell people, to try to pay what it says on your bill that's due in May. If you pay that amount, then when we do the calculation and the correction, then you're going to either receive a refund because you've overpaid for the year, or it's going to be uh, reflected on your fall installment, and your fall installment will be decreased, and you won't owe as much in the fall. If you try to um, estimate what your tax bill should be, uh, you can do that, but it's kind of like a buyer beware thing because if you don't pay enough and we do the calculation, you will get, you could get um, an interest uh, applied to your bill because you underpaid it, and if you didn't pay it on time, you'll have a penalty in interest. So, and those cannot be waived. So that's why we always suggest it's very hard to calculate what the bill should be. State statute does say that if your property is under appeal, you can use the last correct assessment, which would have been last year's, but then with this year's tax rates plus referendum, and you have to do those calculations <laughs> are pretty tricky. So if you feel you can do that, or then do that, but just know that if you make a mistake and don't pay enough, <coughs> You, you could get interest and penalties applied. That's why we always suggest, if you can, pay the May installment, and then we'll correct it from there. And then the thing I wanted to spend most of my time on, I think, is the handouts that are the comparison sheets that look like tax bills. Because I think the tax bill calculation, we get a lot of questions on that. Some people, I'm sure, just look at it and throw it away. They just don't pay attention. But if you're trying to figure this out, it is a little confusing. So what I did is I did five different examples of um, houses in different, in different taxing districts, but they all, they're all in South Bend. They all live in South Bend. That was my one unity thing here. So I just wanted to say that in Indiana, we calculate the tax bills two ways. Table one, which is the top part, is that's kind of the traditional way. And I did not do a slide up, the, up here, so I apologize, but I think the numbers would have been too small, you wouldn't see it up here anyway. So that's why I did the handout instead. But if you, um, we do the tax calculation two methods. Table one is the traditional tax method where they start with a gross assessed value minus any deductions that you might have, which are at the bottom in table five, the bottom right hand corner. It says what deductions you have effective for that year. So it's going to be the gross assessed value minus your deductions to get your net assessed value. And you pay taxes on the net assessed value. So then the net assessed value times your tax rate. They have an amount there for your gross tax amount. Uh, St. Joe County offers two um, tax credits to the taxpayers. We have one for everyone that has a homestead. So we have a homestead credit and a property tax replacement credit that every property in the county receives. So that credit is listed there on the next line and subtracted. And then I put a, like a dark line underneath there 
because I think this is a state form, first of all, so we can't change the state form. But I think the state form is missing a line that would really help make this help make this make a little bit more sense. If you take the gross taxes minus the credits that we allow, there should be a subtotal line there. So it should tell you what the subtotal is. So in my first example, example one, that is the 119104, which happens to be the tax amount there at the bottom. And when we do the calculations, um, like I said, we do them in two ways, table one, and then table two is by property tax caps. Whichever is lower will be your tax bill. So what we do is we do table one, then we compare it to table two. Table two is gonna take your assessment based on the way the assessor has allocated it between 1%, 2%, and 3% caps. Do that calculation, that's the first line there. So in this case, in the number one, it'd be 128,400 at 1%. Anything on line two where it says uh, other residential and farmland, that's at 2%. So if there was a number in that line, it would be times 2%. And the 1C line, the third line down, that's at 3%. So if you take the 3% of 300, the 1% 1 of 1284, you'll come up to the 1293 on the first line on table two. Then you, if you're in an area that has a referendum, then you add the referendum calculation to that tax cap, and that brings you to the most that the, you can pay in taxes per the state statutes. So in this example, per the tax cap calculation, they can't be more than 1,500, but the calculation we did in table one came out to 1,191, so that is their tax bill. Their tax bill is whichever is lower. Hope I didn't go too fast or didn't make sense. I wanna go over at least one more just to show you. If you go to number two, that one is a little bit more complicated the first, it's all of it's the same until you get down, and I wrote them in, I wrote numbers in there under by where the dark line is, right under 4A. So if you look at those numbers, the 12,344 minus 1409 equals 10,935.14. So that's how much it came out in the first calculation. But then we're comparing that to table two, and that's only 5558. So they're saying that's the most your taxes can be. So therefore, on 4B, there's a minus savings due to property tax cap of $5,376.54. So that's an additional credit that's applied to the tax bill to bring it down to the 558060, which is the property tax cap calculation. Again, it's whichever is lower is the one that's gonna be your tax bill. And hopefully I didn't lose you all. But there's just a couple more examples and basically it's the same thing. Um, the one last thing I think I'll just point out is number five is a rental home. So if you notice on the bottom right hand corner there are no deductions. Uh, there is nothing on line 1A because that's where the homestead valuation would be for the assessed value but almost all of it is on line two because that's a, could be, if they had a homestead, the assessed value would have been 145.6, but since there's no homestead, it goes down to line two, and that's all calculated at 2%. So it's 2% of that 145,000 plus 3% of the 1,500 to bring you to the total in table two. And I know I just threw a lot of numbers out at you, but I wanted to kind of explain just in general, how that works. If you have questions about that, let me know. Or if you want to come to the office and ask me, I'd be glad to explain, explain that to you. And I think that's all I have. Thank you. Good evening. Steve Dalton, financial advisor. John gave me a big build up there, so I better uh, bring the goods. Um, I th here's what I thought I'd do, because I, I would still be confused, even though you guys did a great job. So I thought I'd ask a couple follow-up questions before everybody else did. Mike, how do we get to the Form 11 this week? What, what happened to get to value that went out on all those Form 11s? What, what took place behind the scenes? 
so what takes uh, place behind the scenes is, is a reassessment process. So there's a couple of things the state requires us to do. One, we have to reassess, meaning we have to look at, uh, it's a cyclical process, and so we have to look at a quarter of the county. But the state also asks us to do an annual ratio study, which means we have to compare the median assessment of your neighborhood to meet potential median sales in your neighborhood. And whatever that percentage difference is, up or down, we have to apply to the neighborhood. We send that to the state, and if there's a change, then we're required by law to send out a Form 11 notifying you that there's a change. So this is really driven, a couple of things drive this. It's, it's not the assessor's office. It's, it's the purchase of the cells, and it's the state requirements to, to govern you know, those cells and how it impacts the market. Okay, so let me just follow it forward on the calendar because that's this week, that's April. So a bunch of months, a year has gone into work to get the Form 11s out so everybody knows their value for, for this year. Kathy, what happens from Form 11 to when we certify net assessed value? Because there's a difference, as you mentioned, between the gross value that's being sent out by the assessor and the net assessed value, which we're gonna use for the budget process. What, what takes place there? We take the um, gross assessed value, make sure all of the deductions that have been applied for are there, all of the exemptions are applied, abatements that have been approved and filed for, make sure we get all of that in there and then um, I don't want to confuse people, but there's also a big process with TIFs. So there's a calculation of a TIF neutralization factor. It's a special calculation that has to be done on any parcels that are in a TIF. When all of that is done, then we have what's called the certified net assessed value. That is submitted to the state and they have to approve it. We have to explain any big differences that we may have, but then the state uses that information along with the budgets that have been, that will be submitted by the different taxing districts to come up with the tax rates. Okay, so end of April, Form 11s. Over the next couple months, we move our way towards certified net assessed value. And then immediately on the heels of getting that certified net assessed value, all of the taxing units begin working on their budgets. They do so in June and July and August. We start seeing public hearings in September and adoption hearings in October. And those councils and those township boards and those library boards and airport boards are all setting various property tax levies to support the operations of those units of government for the following year. Okay, so I, I did all that on purpose just so that the smallest print document, which is four pages, which is called the tax rate tab, would make a little bit more sense. The tax rate tab that I uh, use as a handout is the tax rate by every individual fund, property tax rate by every individual fund in the county for every taxing district. There are, I think, 32 taxing districts in St. Joseph County. And you might ask, why are there 32 taxing districts? I don't think that there's that many towns and cities. Well, South Bend itself is four or five taxing districts because it lives in different townships. South Bend lives in Clay and South Bend lives in Center and South Bend lives in Portage. So each of those portions of South Bend is a different taxing district because each of them is comprised of different taxing units. So South Bend Clay is South Bend, Clay Township, the school system, the library, the airport. But South Bend that sits in Portage Township has a different set of units that are receiving those property taxes. So we have 32 little boxes, and each of those has a different total tax rate, which you'll see on pages two and four, and they range between about $2 per hundred and five or $6 per hundred, depending on if you're in a rural area that doesn't have a town or city or inside a city where you have a larger tax rate. And those tax rates are then used, as Kathy said, to multiply times either your gross minus your deductions, or the other calculation that she mentioned, which is this circuit breaker. So let's think that it through. If my tax rate is $5 per 100, that's really the same as 5%. So that means the same thing. And if I'm going to pay 5% of my net assessed value, which is a small number, because it has all those deductions take, taken out, or I'm going to compare that, because I own the house, to 1% times my gross assessed value. My house is worth 150, so that's an easy calculation. That's $1,500. I'm comparing my net assessed value times 5%, to my $150,000 gross assessed value times 1%, which is the cap provided by the constitutional uh, change that was made in 2008. And I'm comparing those two numbers and I'm paying the least. 
That's a, that's a big mouthful. Circuit breaker, which is the term we throw around, is the term that was implemented back in the 2007 and 2008 so that no homestead owner would pay more than 1%. No renter or landlord or farm would pay more than 2%. And no business would pay more than 3% of their gross value. Although, Kathy's going to like nudge me because I forgot to say referendum. If you're in an area that has adopted and, and voted for a tax increase referendum, you will pay 1% plus the mill rate for your referendum. 2% plus that same rate for the referendum or 3% plus. So when we're talking about circuit breakers, they matter to you because they're protecting you as a taxpayer. They're protecting you at 1%, 2%, 3%. But they also matter to the government because the government, in the case of the county, what's our total levy? About $75 million for the county. We're not going to collect $75 million because you're only going to pay 1%, 2%, or 3%. We'll collect something closer to $62 million. Is that a good estimate? So that means that the delta, the difference between 75 and 62, is what we have to budget so that we know we're not going to collect as much as the levy would allow. That circuit breaker difference matters to the budgeting process and has to be taken into account as much as it matters to you, even though in your case it's the only tax bill you're writing. Um, and that 1%, you're thinking about it, I can tell right now, you're thinking, well, wait a minute. When the assessor raises my value, the 1% piece goes up, whether the tax rate went up or not. And you're right. If all of the tax rates went down, that would be great for all of us, and that would happen as, as values go up. But as values go up, so also does the gross assessed value. So if your home that you bought for $100,000 is now worth $300,000, and the assessor has begun to trend towards current market values, you're starting to see values on your home for your assessed value going from 150 to 175 to 200 to 225. You're starting to make a run at your real market value, and that 1% times your real market value is a larger number. That's the protection that's built into the Constitution. The protection of the Constitution doesn't say that you get to pay what you last paid for the house. The protection of the Constitution says you get to pay no more than 1% times the current market value established by the assessor with the rules that apply. So that's the constitutional circuit, cap, circuit caps you asked me to talk about, John, and the overlapping taxing units. I pause if you want me to. You want to do questions? Yeah. One quick thing, just one quick thing. Um, over 65 circuit breaker, he's talking about you know, caps. The over 65 circuit breaker, if you qualify for that, it's not just 65, first of all, there are income limits and assessed value limits. Right. But if you qualify for the over 65 circuit breaker, there's some misconception that it's gonna prevent your tax bill from going up more than 2%. It prevents your tax bill from going up more than 2% on your homestead assessed value, that value that's on line one. So the taxes on the value on line one can't go up more than 2%, that's protected. But there aren't any limits on if you have any assessed value at the two or 3% cap, the second or third line, that 2% circuit breaker, over 65 circuit breaker doesn't apply. I just wanna clarify Good that. Reminder. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Steve, let me ask you one other question. I didn't put it on the agenda, but okay. why don't you talk a little bit about how much the government is limited under a normal circumstance from one year to the next and growth well, coach, I mentioned, growth I mentioned the term 75 million, so that was probably a big number, so I'll start with that number. We, we as a county are not allowed to just tax you as much as we want. It would be awesome probably for all the departments to be able to give as much raise as they want, but they can't just tax you because they are desirous of taxing you. We are constitutionally limited to a growth rate for that $75 million in property taxes to the county. And that growth rate is tied to the five-year rolling average of wage growth in the state of Indiana. We expect that that growth rate will be 5% in this, this year's numbers that will come out because incomes have been growing quite quickly. Every unit of government has a similar, they use the same exact growth rate. Every unit of government has a different levy maximum. In, in our case, it's 75 right now. And the other, other units of government may have 10, may have 15, might have 20 million, because that's where they were set when they were originally formed, and they've been growing from that number ever since. The airport, I don't even know their number. But let's say the airport was a million dollars 50 years ago, and it's $2 million today it got there, because it was using that same exact growth rate that every unit of government was using for the last 20 years. Did that answer your question? Yeah, that, that was a good answer. So in certain cases, the tax rate itself has gone down, like for St. Joseph County, but the revenue has gone right. up. Is that fair to say? Yep. It's also fair to say, 
how do I say this? We wonder if our councils and our boards set our tax rates. And I have pushed back at times semantically. The councils and boards don't set tax rates. Councils and boards set budgets. Councils and boards approve levies. Those levies are then divided by the assessed value, the sort of net certified net assessed value, and a tax rate is the result of the formula. So when we're sitting around this table uh, this summer, looking through the county's multi-hundred million dollar budget for all of its funds, we won't be talking about what the tax rate is going to be. We'll be talking about what the levies will be and what the budgets will be. The tax rate will be given to us by the state in January when the certified net assessed values are married to those levies for that formula. So on the handout that you received, you can see that some of the tax rates have gone down from the prior year, but I know that doesn't, you know, that doesn't make you feel good because it's still, it, overall, you're paying more. But there are some limits in place for governments. Is that fair to say, Steve? Absolutely. Do we have any other, any other questions from the audience? You want to go to the podium? That might be easier to hear. Okay. Okay. No, no. We're asking if you can go to the podium so we can hear you. Yes. And if you could just tell us your name. It'd be a... you, you dropped some paperwork. Oh, I did. Yeah. You know, I've listened to you, and you've got dozens of formulas come up with this problem. Well, what you don't understand is that when you double somebody's tax rate from 2,000 to 4,000, where are they getting the money? If they're on a limited income, where are they getting the money? They don't qualify f for the over 65 rate for the simple reason that you don't give us enough growth in our property to take a cut from it. So you guys constantly come up with these formulas, and you double our rates according to your formulas, because you're not taking humans into consideration. The state of Indiana has over a billion dollars in surplus money, and you're telling me that you guys can't take some of that or get some of it from somebody? I just don't think it's fair, and I don't know what the hell there is to do about it, other than move out of the state of Indiana. Because, you know, I know you're all smiling, but it ain't funny when you can't come up with the money to pay your taxes. And I was struggling before, but now I'm real. I was just starting to get, get in, get up, catch up with it. And now I'm going to be back in the hole again. And I don't see any benefit that I'm getting from it. The only benefit I get from the county is police and fire. Everything else, or maybe road. That's it. I don't use anything else. And I still got to pay all these outrageous taxes for your airports and all your other stuff. It's not fair. And I don't know how you can explain how you can do that. Do you have some kind of property tax loan that you can get and put it on a 50-year timeline? You, you guys don't have an answer for that. I know you don't. Well, actually, I'd like to address that if you'll allow me. Um, so it's not lost on us the impact of property values going up. Uh, this is a derivative of what's happening in the market that there's not enough affordable housing that's driving the value. This is why I've worked with the legislators to try to help put in protections for the taxpayers. This year there was 26 pieces of legislation that went to the floor. Of the 26, 23 of them went away. Uh, there seems to be some some discussion that needs to needs to come from us to our legislators Because a lot of this is is put into place by the legislators We're just the governing body of the rules that we have to follow by the state so amongst Us talking to to the legislators It's imperative that as we as a collective group reach out to our legislators and ask him to put into place protections for these situations doesn't doesn't help us though, right? It will if they put it in place. They've done it in other states. And one of the things we talked about was a tax assessment cap. Uh, and I know it was brought up for conversation. There, there was some issues on whether or not constitutionally they can enact that. And so this summer they're putting together 
uh, a forum to try to come up with reasonable solutions to to help the residential homeowners uh, because what we've seen over the last uh, I would say eight years is we're seeing property values go up and if you look at some of the sales some a couple of years ago the, the the sales were people were selling their houses in an hour for fifty sixty thousand dollars more than what they just purchased it for just a couple of years prior so it's not lost on us and we understand that's why I, I have tried to make it clear that it's imperative that when you file the appeal process, we have that open conversation so that we get your assessment as correct as we can. Uh, it doesn't help. I mean, you guys, if you want to save money, I can give you a lot of ways to save money for the county, but you just won't do it. Why don't you start drug testing all the people on welfare? And they don't get it unless they pass the drug test or they go to work. You know, that's another way. That's another one. But I guess I'm not going to get anything out of you other than what you just told me. Oh, I'm dropping them all over, aren't I? Come on. I want to thank you for the meeting because I'm totally ignorant of this because it's the last five years, my taxes have gone up so much. That's why I started getting involved in it. And probably the biggest problem I have is I have filed, again, you know, the rate increase and stuff. It's the attitude of the people that some of them that you just can't, you know, they just don't want to work with you. A good example would be, isn't there a percentage that you can only raise them up to a certain, say, 5% of what the value is or something? Is there a percentage on that? So there may be a bit of confusion. Uh, there, there was legislation that was recently rewritten. The legislation said that if assessment went up more than 5%, then the burden of proof was on the assessor's office. Well, so they I would mine, and, and they so, hadn't proved it. So, so what I would tell you is the way. So I, I just got into the county three months ago. The way I've approached it in Penn is I always take the burden of proof, regardless of what the percentage okay. is. That's why I, I tried to impress on you that the appeal process is really the important cog to us making sure the assessment process is fair. I know that there, in the past there may have been some miscommunications and maybe some issues with, with conveying information and, and that's what we're gonna work on to make sure that we're more transparent and that, that the uh, communication is, is there for you. Uh, one of those things is we're bringing in a new uh, operating system that's gonna look at online resources that make the process easier for you so that we can convey information on a more timely basis, making the appeal process more effective. Good, I appreciate that. I'm looking forward to that. I wanna give you one example. I had a next door neighbor live next door me for five years. He sold his house for after five years for the exact same thing that he purchased it for. Same house, he has the same property, same size house, except he has a swimming pool and an extra garage that's heated and stuff, but yet my taxes went way up more, or the assessment more than what the value of his, he sold his house for. And they can't give me an answer. So there, there are those anomalies, you know, in the assessment process. The yeah. assessment process is not infallible. Uh, as the state continues to change the legislation, uh, you know, and, and put stricter requirements, yeah. it's dependent on the assessor's office to ensure that the staff uh, is, is certified and trained in the manner that they yeah. need to be to, to catch those particular issues. So one of the things we have, uh, uh, have worked on here recently is bringing in uh, resources to help mitigate some of those shortfalls. But as I had said in my presentation, as much of the appeal process is, is impendent on the resources of the assessor's office, it's also uh, the responsibility of the taxpayer to help us correct some of those issues. 
meaning that conveyance of information on the information of the property record card, if we don't have it correct, yeah. a simple conversation helps us get that data correct. So, so why is this really important on the big picture? If we get all the data correct, then our numbers on the ratio study get tighter and the trending is more reflective of, the, of the, those issues uh, in the neighborhood and it makes it, makes it more effective. So it really, I think the assessment process needs to, to open up the, the, uh, the conversation with the taxpayers to ensure that we're collecting the data in the manner that we need to. Good. I'm glad to hear that. So, and I do appreciate the meeting because what that gentleman was talking about, I had, had to pay mine went up a thousand. This I had to pay a thousand more dollars more this year than I did, or this coming year before I did last year. So I'm hoping that you are behind and I get something, you know, let me know what it is and so forth. Because I'll probably be seeing you down there because I still have some questions. I had a hard time following. Some, it was great, but I wish you would have put the forms up here. It would have made it much easier oh, to I follow things. I think you'd be things. able to see it. I, I really, because okay. they started out, it was great. Then you sort of lost me when you, you went into the, some details and stuff and, and that. And so anyhow, I want to thank you very much. And it's, it is a positive meeting in that, so. Well, I did want to say that um, we will be doing those corrections as quickly. Pardon? We are going to be working on all okay. those corrections as quickly as possible. And to you and to the other gentleman that came up, um, we do understand it's a hardship yeah. for the taxes to go up that much. I mean, um, I know at least two of us up here right now, ours <laughs> went up quite a bit. Okay, yeah. I don't know everybody's, but I know at least two of ours did. Well, it's so, been a, about the last five years or six years, has read, it's been tough, mm -hmm. especially. It's been really tough. So, yeah. But unf unfortunately, I just wanted to point out that although there is a little bit of a percentage thing that um, Mike talked about, that on the tax calculation side, though, the legislature doesn't have anything in place to limit how much your taxes go up except for the over 65 circuit breaker. That's, That's the only That's the one. thing that I honestly didn't understand is the percentages. How, you know, if, if what percentage I'm, you know, what my percentages is and stuff like the 1%, I, I believed that everybody had the same percent. I didnn't realize that until yeah. today. That's why I, I really wish you would have had that forms yeah. up there so I could have followed so, it a little yeah, better. So basically on that page that I was talking about, anything on line one, is 1%. The second line okay. is 2%. The third line is 3%. Normally, it's just your house and up to one acre of land can be on line one. That's, okay. that's it. Line right. two is usually like farmland. Line three are things like the pools, the things that go down there for at, at 3%. But okay. those are assigned by the assessor's office depending on what they are. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Lisa Jaworski, and thank you for being here tonight. Um, I had some questions mainly regarding the deductions section, mm -hmm. uh, table five. Um, I'm in the new world of kind of being retired, so forgive me if the yellow paper explains this, but I haven't read it all. If we are... Uh, a married couple owning our home, and one is 65 plus and one is under 65, is it potential that we could qualify for an over 65 deductible? Yes, you don't both, a married couple, you don't both have to be over 65. However, okay. both of your incomes have to qualify Within the under income. the income limit, okay. yes. Okay, and if one of the couple is disabled and 65, can you potentially get both deduction. Okay, the person, okay, and I'm gonna say this right now. If I misspeak, my helpers in the back row, please wave at me and tell me I've, I've blown it, okay? That I've made a mistake. But um, the same person cannot have the over 65 and disability. 
So you, the, if you qualify, you're going to get one or the yeah. other. Yeah. So like if one spouse is disabled and the other spouse is over 65, you can both apply for those. But if but one if is the both. if it's the same person, the over 65 deduction has qualifications that says it can't be combined with okay. almost any other deduction. So if the spouse that's disabled is over 65 situation, then we're yeah, going to get one or the other if we qualify. Right. And can defer to the best deal to us. Right. Uh, you get the highest qualification, right? Yeah. You can. You can and get. So. The, yeah. And we try to lead you in that direction. Okay. To get you the one that has the higher deduction. Okay. And then, I'm not totally understanding this circuit breaker, 65 versus regular 65. The oh, the over 65 is a deduction and a circuit breaker cap. So there's two parts. So one is the deduction. So that's off of your gross assessed value to get down to your net assessed value okay. that's multiplied. And then the other one is the over 65 circuit breaker. Now, if you have the, let's go back a little bit. If you have the disability, let's say, if you're one of those people that you're over 65 and disabled and you can only have one. So you take the disability, let's, that's for our example. You can still have the over 65 circuit breaker. That one doesn't limit other deductions. Okay, so you can still have that over 65 circuit breaker if you qualify under the income limits and the age and the assessed value limits, then you can get the over 65 circuit breaker and that prevents just the homestead part of the assessed value. The taxes on that portion can't go up more than 2% from year to year, okay. regardless of how much you know, the increase could be $100,000, doesn't matter. It's gonna be 2% of whatever your bill was last year on that assessed value. Okay, and since you said earlier that the bills we just got in the mail cannot really be adjusted unless an error is found. Right. If, if as my husband and I sit down and look this over, if we see that we qualify for either the 65, the circuit breaker one, or the disabled one, mm -hmm. and we would have also qualified under last year's. Is that called an error? Or is no. it, an we, error, we were poor and didn't figure it out, we should have done it. <laughs> yeah, no. Unfortunately, a deduction application can never go backwards. Not retro. No, so okay. a, a deduction application is always effective the year in which you file. So a, an error would be that you filed timely in that year but then somehow it didn't get applied to your tax bill correctly. Okay. That would be an error and we could fix okay. it. So an error would be things like, if they said I have a swimming pool but I don't. That, yes. That's something. That would be a correction and, that the assessor would make. Is that a make. correction that could occur to the prior years? No. No. If you find that I'll out. I'll leave that one up to you. Right, so, um, so there's, there's some things that, when we look at correction to error for assessments, uh, and, and before getting into that, I do want to ask a question because I think it, it, we, we need to expand a little bit on okay. the requirements for the over 65 because I worked on the legislation for that so with uh, uh, Senator Rogers. So I, I do want to talk about that. Um, but when we talk about a uh, correction of error for the assessor's office, uh, if there was, if, so what would be a correction of error is if I put a pool on there that never existed at all. If the pool was there and you removed it for whatever reason and failed to tell the assessor's office, that wouldn't be a that wouldn't be an error on the assessor's office because you may not have fell in the time frame that we would have reviewed your property again. If we did review it through the reassessment and didn't remove that pool, then it would be considered an error on the assessor's office, and then we can make that correction through a form one fifteen or one thirteen, right? Anyway, Some we can make the correction. <laughs> yeah, there's so many forms. I'm, I'm you know, so even you can get confused. Yeah, but the bottom line is, if, if I go and request a copy of that description of my property. The reason I brought up a pool is because I know way back 30 years ago when I bought the house, it mentioned there being a pool, but there wasn't. Okay. As far as I know, we corrected it back then, but if for some reason we screwed up or whatever and never removed that pool, it's still sitting on there, um, that's where we need to make contact, get the things corrected. Right, to the assessor's office. So I'll, I'll tell you what I do as a matter of procedure to help the taxpayer. We do aerials every year, and so I'll go back through the aerial and see when the pool was last there, and then I'll make the correction for you. Okay. Uh, and 
Can, can I expand yeah. on the over 65? Okay. Uh, and, and please correct me if, if I'm wrong, because this is the expert in the field, but I just, I, I'm really excited about some of the legislation that, that has come forth and some of the talk that's happening with, especially the over 65 deduction. So it used to be in order to qualify for the over 65, your assessment couldn't be any more than 200,000 and the total uh, income that the couple could have could not exceed 25,000, not including your social security. Now they've changed that. Um, they changed that to uh, 30,000 for an individual and 40,000 for a couple. Again, not including the social security. The assessment now changed to 240,000, is that correct? But here's what's interesting about that portion of it. It used to be uh, that, because we're seeing assessments jump as a reflection of what's happening in the market. And so one of the conversations that we had and I had with the senators was, the, the, the people who get to over 65 deduction who bought their house for 150,000 10 years ago, it's now worth 300,000. Now you just took them out of the deduction category. So what they're working on, and I don't know if it's become legislation, so maybe she'll, she'll correct me here, but if you qualify for the over 65 and your assessment exceeds that 240,000, you still get the deduction. And I think that's something we've worked on over the last year or so, okay. and it's, gonna, it's either in place or gonna come in place. Can you speak about that? Well, I'm going to pass it on to Patty. Because she's shaking her head because she knows the answer. So do you mind coming oh, up? Oh, Patty, we got you. We got you. <laughs> One last question after the yes. she sure. answers. Could you please define what neighborhood is? Because someone has told me it's not just what I think of as my neighborhood, but it could include beyond my neighborhood. Could you address that after she speaks? Absolutely, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, okay, Patty. hi guys. So when it comes to uh, when it comes to the over sixty five deduction, it did pass. Okay. So uh, trending, once you have the over sixty five deduction, even if your assessed value were to go over the the limit of two hundred forty thousand, you still get to keep that deduction as long as it was trending or or a cyclical assessment or something that happened. You didn't do a major improvement. If you did a major hundred thousand dollar improvement addition to your home that could cause it to go off um i don't believe they've changed that legislation right. so i think they're working on that so I, I just appreciate the clarification so let's let's just recap so what she's saying is if your house was 100 say two hundred forty thousand, and the trending moved it to 270,000 and you made no significant changes to the home, meaning you didn't do an addition or add three car garage or whatnot, then you're still entitled to that, uh, to that exemption. And I think that's a really good uh, protection for the, uh, for the over 65. And I know they're working on, um, on raising the cap of 240. Uh, because it's still, in our opinion, not reflected in the market. But again, that's a conversation that people should be having with their legislators. So, so I appreciate that. I want to go back to uh, the, uh, the lady's uh, question. Could I define a uh, neighborhood? So the, the, the Indiana Code under the Department of Local Government Finance for assessment process says that the minimum requirements for a neighborhood is 50 homes. So most people think of a neighborhood in more of a two or three block radius. You know, my neighbors live on the street next door and so you can only compare me to that. But the Indiana requirements for assessment is, is again, like I talked before, is mass appraisal. So neighborhoods could be upwards to 1,500 or 2,000 homes. What are the requirements to have that many homes in the neighborhood? It, it has to be contiguous, meaning that the neighborhoods have to be relatively close in age and uh, so in other words, you can't have a home built or, or neighborhood. Let me give a great example of that. Um, uh, uh, over in Osceola, you have older homes and you got a, a neighborhood in, um, uh, no, I can't remember where, what the name of the neighborhood is. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, but it's off of Vistula. There's a brand new neighborhood over there. That neighborhood can't be compared to the, the homes around it. So that's what we're taught when we talk about neighborhoods is a contiguous. So yes, you could have 1500 homes, but they have to be uh, comparable in nature. So I can't compare you to a home that's 50 years newer than, 
than what's unless it unless it was a home that for example uh, a home burns down and they build a brand new home then we would extract that from any one of the the uh, the studies that we would do um, so does that answer your question so it, has to be a it has to be minimum of 50. Yes, it would be beyond that, and it would be appended on the assessor to make sure that we put you with, with a, again, with a neighborhood that's similar to your neighborhood in, in style and age. And, and there is a place to go look to see what my neighborhood boundaries are? Well, uh, yes, but I, I don't know if you would, if you would uh, uh, be able to, to navigate it. Um, so we can give you the district, we can give you the area and a neighborhood code, but you're not going to know whether or not I have placed, uh, you know, other, other homes in that neighborhood. N no, it's, you, 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 no, we could put it in the map and we can, we can, you know, break down the map and show you the neighborhood numbers and you can correlate that with what's on your property record card. But I, I think it's going to be a quite extensive task to, to try to figure that out. What might be more helpful, I think, from personal experience, is maybe requesting a listing of those houses that sold in the last year in your neighborhood, because those are the ones that affected you. Thank you. All right. Mm -hmm. So we do publish that every year. Do you have a question? And I think we have somebody else, too. Just real quick. So if you live in a rural farm community, all the majority, well, I know I would say all the houses were built not before 1970. They're probably in the 30s. So how do you get the assessed value? Because mine increased 50%, and there has been no house on my row that has sold in the last year. Um, and so it wouldn't seem fair to compare me to, there are some sub, I live in New Carlisle. Okay. So I'm on the far side of St. Joe County. There are some subdivisions um, in New Carlisle, but when you're out in the county on farm property, how do you possibly determine the assessed value? So, so we class a particular property. So you, the agricultural uh, neighbor, the agricultural uh, parcels we put in an agricultural class and have its own neighborhood. So in this case, the agricultural neighborhood in your in your quadrant may be quite big, but it would only contain agricultural property. So you wouldn't be compared to a subdivision in 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 that in the study that we would do. How would the property value increase seventy thousand from last year? So uh, based on no sales. I, I'm glad that you that you um, brought this question up because I knew it was going to come up at some point in time, and I th I think we should uh, address it. Uh, last year, uh, the county did a comprehensive land study, uh, which, by the way, I kind of spoke out against uh, um, as your Penn Township assessor at the time. Um, I knew that the the impact of the land study would be quite extensive on a taxpayer, and so I wanted to take a pause. Um, but unfortunately, it didn't. They didn't heed my uh, concern, and they passed it anyway. And then went on to the state, and the state approved it. But what what happened is essentially the land study is required by state for you to do every ten years. And if you look back 10 years you know, from, from now, it would have been the 2012 time period. Unfortunately, we didn't have enough sales in 2012 because we're coming off the back end of the, of the real estate market crashing. And so the state of Indiana, in their infinite wisdom, and yes, I'm going to call them out, uh, decided that you only had to have one year of sales, which is, in my opinion, not indicative of any market. Uh, but we could there wasn't enough sales for us to apply any value so now you'd have to go back to 2002 for the last land study so now you're covering 20 years of adjustments and since 2012 the market has really uh you know jumped out of uh, of, of what the normal values are we're i mean we're seeing values jump higher than we've ever seen in this area uh, for many, many decades. And so what you got was this long period where they were adjusting. Uh, that's why, again, um, you know, I'm looking at the areas uh, that were impacted the most, especially the agricultural, and we're, we're trying to uh, do an in-house audit. So I encourage you to file an appeal 
uh, on that so we can take a look at that, that, that parcel. Unfortunately, um, this is a, a process that was required by the state and that's really what happened. The crazy thing is they did not increase the value of the acreage, which to me seems more valuable than the house that was built in 1970. They increased the. So I the, guess I should be glad with the, that they didn't. Even, right. They didn't well, they increased the. Acreage. They didn't increase the the agricultural because you can't do a land study on agricultural land, but on the one acre home, home site they most certainly did. In fact, we saw values skyrocket across the county. So that is one of my my number one taskings is looking at. Uh, the areas that were impacted the most. And I think what we have found or what we're, or our preliminary, preliminary discussion is we had multiple agricultural uh, neighborhoods. And I think what we're looking at is putting each township into its own, only one agricultural neighborhood so that we can look at uh, the value uh, numbers different with them than, than what the whole uh, township was looked at. And so we're working on that. And uh, I ask for you guys to be patient and allow us to, you know, to move forward, uh, but in the interim to file the appeal. Okay, great. Thank yep. you. While we're waiting, just for a second, I just want to make one clarification that I thought of when this lady over here was up. When I said a correction needs to be made, if it's a correction on a deduction or an exemption, then you come to the auditor's office. And if it's something that we missed, we're gonna fix it. If you think it's a correction that needs to be made to the assessed value, you would need to go to the assessor's office for that kind of a correction. Hi, just really quick, super similar to her situation, um, except all of the agriculture around the homes was sold and it's now turning into commercial properties, warehouses, stuff like that and the value has gone up over, a little over 70,000. So putting these commercial buildings and warehouses on the farmland, is it doing the same thing? So we, by law, can't compare commercial properties to, to uh, residential. Uh, so then the broader question needs to be answered. How does economic development impact the sales of, of residential properties? And so as, as neighborhoods mature and more uh, resources are available, it, it can impact you know, the, the sales of properties. So if you have economic development, uh, proximity to shopping centers, uh, better schools, no, like those- Amazon facility. Well, 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 I get that. I, I mean- <laughs> Not that we don't all love Amazon, but it's will, all warehouses being placed on the farmlands around the house, so. Uh, it does, it, it, it can impact it either positively or negatively. And, and so that's why, you know, the, the reassessment process is kind of imperative because as I'm starting to look at sales from her appeals and then sold properties in a particular area like that, if we see uh, property values drop, that's an indication to me that there's a problem. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Several years ago, the state took Capitol Road through eminent domain, mm -hmm. and they took away uh, an entrance to the neighborhood, and all of a sudden, we see th this portion, and we're going to talk about neighborhoods again. Uh, they were part of a bigger neighborhood. It was just a little, a little subdivision uh, that only had one entry, and those values plummeted. And I couldn't see it until we saw the appeal process, and then I was able to make the correction and do and pull them out of the study and then make an independent uh, review study of just those homes in that, that particular area. Mm -hmm. So if I see that in the appeal process through the reassessment, uh, we'll look at the impact as the commercial properties are brought into the neighborhood. Okay. Thanks. Yep. My name is Kelly Gum and I'm from New Carlisle also. <laughs> so we're all dealing with that mess out there. Um, I wanna tell you, I appreciate you explaining the assessed value process because in the last two years, my assessed value has doubled for my property. I've lived there 30 years and I've never had increases like this. My taxes have more than doubled. Um, and last year I did appeal. And basically my answers were, well, if you sold your house, could you get that for it? Probably because the values have gone up. Well, then that's what it is. 
but it was a huge increase last year of more than 30,000 and it's more than 30,000 this year which has doubled my taxes so I appreciate you explaining that and how those numbers came to be um, and I understand the increase but as some of them have said when it goes up that much in two years you just can't afford it and I've lived there 30 years so it is very frustrating um, the other question that I had aside from that so if I was last year pretty much shot down on the appeals process it would make sense to go through that process again and get my property card and and walk through that because of what's transpired with these values being you said something about a five percent rule which is obviously way more than five percent yeah that that was the old rule but i would always tell you if if you know you don't agree with the assessment to always file the appeal I mean, um, it's just such a substantial increase in such a short time. I mean, I know it's gradually increased, but like I said, to live there 30 years and have my taxes double in two is, is almost unmanageable. Well, we've seen, you know, prices now go up for, for several years. I, I will give some positive, uh, uh, you know, I guess, the perceptions of the, of the market. So sales have went down by almost 30% this year which means that we're starting to see the, the market kind of level out. And so when I looked at the ratio studies this year, uh, we had, it, it's, it's, it's back to normal prior to, so COVID really drove a lot of the, the uh, dispo, uh, disposable income that people were getting and they were, you know, they were buying these houses. We're starting to see that level out now. And, and so, you know, my, my perception of the market is that we're going to start to see uh, less of those spikes in the market. And then as we get the data correct and we get those, those, those trending factors tighter, uh, you're going to have less of, of what we see in those spikes. But I guess the key to this is for us to get the data correct. So I appreciate you, you know, bringing your concerns. Uh, and, but the answer to your question is the appeal remains the single handedly the most important tool, not only for you, but for me, because it helps me uh, collect that data. And like I said, I, I was shut down pretty cold last year with not a lot of answers. So well, there's a new sheriff in town, so uh, uh, please also, file that appeal. And I also didn't understand. I'm like, I didn't put $30,000 into my property or $50,000. Why, why is it saying it's increased that much? And I didn't understand that until tonight. So I do appreciate that. Um, on that property card, I have something on line three, obviously. I don't know what that is. Will that property card, will that explain what that additional um, line three assessed value is? So are, are you talking about the tax bill or are you talking about the property record yeah, card? She's she's, okay, so she's talking about tax, but do you, you want to? On the assessment. Yeah, but yeah. She wants to know if it's on the property record card. I think you have to ask the um, assessor because I don't believe that it's marked on the property record card, whether it's one, two, or three percent. Okay. I don't yeah, believe. Yeah, I just say besides the. Right, the, it's, it's right not. Now. That but, line 1C, there's something there. I but you will see the numbers. You might see the numbers. Like if you look at the property record card and see there's, well, we'll say a pool and a shed. And you add up those two numbers, and it adds up to your number on line three. That's exactly what it is. Or it could be excess residential acreage. And I'm jumping in on you. Right, so I'm getting kind of excited here. So I, 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 uh, <laughs> I want to talk about some because this is just brought it up, and it just, it just, you know, jumped in my in in my mind here. So what we're really talking about is what would fall into that line is a other structures on your property that Permanent normal structure, right so that would that. normally be at three percent so they just passed legislation both in the in the senate and the house and it's going to the governor's um uh, desk and, and we believe he's going to sign it if you have a property it used to be if you had let, let, let's go back to the property you had a house that had a tash garage and then your husband decided he needed a toy barn and he builds this you know detached garage or you needed the she that, shed whatever whatever it was line. anyway you build that and you're assessed at three percent that would fall in in that category but now the new legislation says if it's attended for the homestead property it can no longer be assessed at three percent it'll be a, it'll fall under the one percent which is a great change to i i think to help protect the taxpayer so that is coming uh in the next year 
uh, you'll see that as the, once the governor signs that bill into law. Because I've never known what that third line was, and I still don't know what that's for today because I just have my house. But um, And the other question I have on a sidebar, what happened with the airport that it jumped so incredibly? Oh, let me address okay. I'm going to bow out of that. 2,000%? <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll address that. Um, there's, uh, you're talking about table three, right? Yeah. Where it says the airport? Yeah. Okay, if you notice, the township rate went down 0.6. It was, went from 0.65 to 0.05. It went down 0.6 because you have a new fire territory. So the fire, the fire territory used to be part of the township rate. And so it was included in the township line. But you have a brand new fire territory this year that is like its own special little unit. Yes, and the is. airport is also considered a special unit by the state. So therefore, on this form, the, fire, the new fire, ter fire territory rate and the airport rate were added together on that line. That's why it's showing such a huge increase and such a huge increase in the taxes. I assume and, that one did. Yeah, and so what we will, we need to change the description. So next year it'll just say specials, not airport. Because you have two, now you now in Olive Township and New Carlisle have two special tax rates. Sorry about Wonderful that. To live in the we didn't catch that, so yeah. sorry. I assume that's what it was. I just wanted clarification. Thank mm -hmm. you. My name is Karen Lamb. Um, I'm going to try and keep my blood pressure down. I had a heart attack seven months ago with five stents, and I have high blood pressure and didn't bring any water with me. So do we need to tell a joke first? No, <laughs> you know, I, it's just uh, having all these other people ask questions, um, I think helped out some. My question is, I purchased my house four years ago in 2019. It was assessed at 89,000. I paid 92 for it. Not this outrageous amount of money that some of these people are paying for houses that are causing all of our rates to go up. My taxes at the time were $650. I'm woohoo, this is wonderful. Last year they almost doubled. This year they want to tack on another $400. Um, I went from a full time job. I am now on Medicare and Medicaid. Doctor said, you're an idiot if you think you're going to go back to the type of work you were doing. I did because somebody told me about these property record cards. I went ahead and pulled mine. I pulled 20 of my neighbors' record cards. Five out of those 20 have the exact same house that I have, the exact same square footage, the exact same front, the same lot. My property taxes are $20,000 assessed more than theirs are. When I started to dig into it, some of them have Attached patios, double car garages, fireplaces, finished basements, none of which that I have. If I go ahead and do an appeal and have these tax records from these other homes and their dollar amounts, will this be something that they will take a look at on an assessment? Because I do not understand how my property can assess for $20,000 more than everybody else on the block for the exact same lot, and they have more additives to theirs than I do. So the answer to that question is absolutely yes. So uh, I, won't, I don't want you to have a hard time. I'm doing, I'm doing pretty good right now. I, I can feel so, my face, but we're good. Yeah, so you're getting a little red there. So I, I'm, I, yeah, the answer to that is yes. Um, so this is the type of stuff that, that I want to hear from. I want to hear from the taxpayer on. I guess I um, don't understand is how it happened. Well, so the assessment process is not infallible, right? Meaning that there's 118,000 parcels in St. Joe County. Okay. And so I have, I have 37 personnel. I have four that go out and look at the properties. So if people make changes or people, uh, have things that happen to their houses, they add those porches or add those sheds or add, I'm just no, saying. They're not added, the, they're on their property card. I know they are. I'm just saying if from the beginning, from the house is built, those things happened, this is what the reassessment process is for. So we're working on training the staff to make sure that they can catch that stuff and making sure that we get that data correct. 
Did you file the appeal? First question. I have not. It's written here. I came okay. here before I went ahead and sent okay. this in. So I think the first process is, is, is to file the appeal, submit the evidence that, that you have, but also you bought your house four years ago, correct? Yes, sir. So you, did you get? Did you pay cash or did you get a mortgage? I got a mortgage, so first you, time home buyer. So you must have got, not must have, I know you got a, an appraisal. Yep. I would tell you to submit the appraisal, although the appraisal is outside of th three years to to be a single defining factor for assessment, I will take it as evidence because I believe it's still indicative of the time period. So okay. I'll take it as additional evidence and I weigh that pretty heavily when I look at, at uh, determining the end value for your property. So I would tell you that the study that you did, I appreciate that because this is the type of thing that helps me direct my staff in the right direction to start correcting some of those issues. Two years ago, I added a pool, a $450 above ground pool that I put up myself. On this property card, that pool is assessed at $4,600? How in God's name can you take a $450 pool and say it's worth that much onto my property taxes? Well, uh, so I'm gonna agree with you. Uh, first of all, I don't think sheds or pools that you get from Walmart add any value to your property. But the, I don't either. But the state still requires us to, to assess them. So one of the reasons how that happens is because we can't go to every property. We look at the properties through aerial pictures and there's no way for me, for our staff to tell if it's a $400 pool or a $4,000 pool. Okay. That's why in the appeal process, you make, you make that, uh, that statement. I send a staff member out to your property, we confirm it and then we make the adjustments appropriately. Now the first gentleman asked this question and I guess I'm gonna ask it again. I went from having a normal job, no problems with paying the house payment, the whole nine yards. I am now down to $1,850 a month between Social Security and the small pension I'm getting from Notre Dame. How am I supposed to keep up with these tax increases? I cannot stay on Medicaid if I try and get any kind of a job to try and offset this because I lose all of my benefits which means I better have a job that's gonna pay at least $800 more to cover that. I don't wanna lose my home. I don't wanna to have to move into God knows what, an apartment that's gonna cost me more than that. What do you do to be able to keep up with this? Because my, thank you, my understanding is if you don't pay your taxes, you'll take the house. Am I understanding that correctly? So, so I don't wanna take your house. Uh, I'll just start there. Um, and, and I'll let you answer, I don't mean to interrupt. Uh, it's not lost on anybody on this panel how the property taxes impact each and everybody in our community, uh, which is why I and other, other people here on this panel have spent significant amount of time with our legislators uh, voicing what you have just said today. Uh, and I think they need to hear it from you guys as well. But we take this information in these forums and I convey it. So we're recording this. I will show this recording to, to our senators and say, listen, this, this is what we're hearing from our constituents. These are the issues that we're looking at. Uh, and we need help because the, all we do on this panel is, is do what the state tells us to do. And so we're just making sure that the information is correct. So first, I would tell you to file the appeal. Okay. Second, I would say talk to your, to your legislators. Uh, and then the third thing, thing to kind of answer the question, and I know she was gonna jump in on this, is there's, I think I better just let you yeah, answer. Just, so um, we're not here to take your house. The, the rules are if you don't pay your taxes over a year period, uh, it can uh, go up for tax sale. However, uh, I think everybody on this panel is willing to work with the taxpayer. We understand the situations, and uh, I think a simple conversation with, with each one of these people on the panel would, would, would go a long way. Now, I am not in that situation because I have a mortgage, so the taxes are rolled into that. But from the looks of it right now, my taxes are going to go up like $50, $40 a month that's going to, they're going to want more money in that escrow account. Yeah, so, so let's, let's file a bill. Uh, let's sit down in a meeting, me and you have a conversation, and we'll go over your property. 
And the other thing was, I did not understand this process. Being a new homeowner, I was stupid. I did not do my due diligence prior to this. So when these taxes went up last year, it was too late to file anything because I had already missed that deadline or I probably should have been asking these questions then. I didn't even know about this meeting except for I saw it on a next door neighborhood site that this meeting was going on. Where was this published or was it something I just missed? Well, no, uh, so, so I want to thank uh, Ms. Karen White for bringing this to, uh, to light and, and John Murphy and other people on this panel. I think this is something that should have been happening from the get-go. Uh, in, in fact, in Penn, I've held several town hall meetings uh, with the taxpayers. Uh, one of the things I think we, we uh, kind of run into is nobody really raises these questions until the tax bill comes up. But I think we, you should really be looking at uh, asking those questions anytime that you, you think there's an issue with your property value. Uh, anytime there's a change, significant change, you sell the house, you buy a house, you should be asking these questions because I think it helps uh, us help you in, in a very positive way. Uh, the only last thing that I've got to say is you had asked um, one of the others, would your house sell for the amount of money that it's being was assessed at? I did I ask that. I don't believe I don't believe that it would. I think somebody uh, would be an idiot to pay that much money for my house, and there's nothing wrong with it. But it is not worth one hundred and forty thousand dollars. Now, some jackass may pay that because they're desperate and pay twenty thousand dollars over and come up with the cash somewhere. But that's affecting all of our property taxes. I'm going to die in this house. Don't plan on selling it. So the property value going up does mean no good because I'm not going to refinance at making $1,850 a month through Social Security. And, and, and I don't see any, anything to balance that out. That's, that's not lost on us. I certainly, I certainly understand that. That's, again, I, I can't, I've said this some, uh, a, at least a half a dozen times. This is why the appeal process is so important for me and you to have that conversation. All righty, thank you. And yeah. I just wanted to comment on a couple things. Uh, you know, the legislature put in the property tax caps to try to help the tax bill, but I really don't think they foresee the they foresee for, they didn't see foresee the big jump in assessed values that ha that happened. They didn't have anything in place to protect the taxpayer from that. So hopefully, like Mike said, they're looking at those things and looking to see what they can put in place to prevent those kind of increases from happening. They just kind of took them, I think, off guard, just like just all, like all of us when we got our tax bills and they went up so much. They didn't see that coming and didn't put it in place. And I just had one other comment because I used to work in the Harris Township Assessor's Office for 15 years before I went to the auditor's office. And when you talked about um, all of your other neighbors were 20%, $20,000 lower, one of my thoughts is, and Mike's comments were great, but I wonder if at any time along the line, those people appealed and had their values lowered. And so now you're putting those increases on what the assessments are, but they had theirs lowered. So that's why they're still lower. See what I'm saying? I'm just saying that could be why they're lower. That they might have appealed in a previous year when oh, you didn't. Planning on appealing this year. Well, but if they did before, they might have had a lower value because of that. The floor is yours. Hello. My name is Bruce Gordon. I'm a real estate agent. I've owned a company for several years. Um, I've sold real estate for about 30 years. And as much as I would just love to sell half million dollar houses and drive around a nice Ferrari, that's not my life. My life is almost every time I come down to help somebody file assessments or appeals, there is somebody at the window, and this has happened a day ago, and I listened to the guy at the window, and I exactly knew what he was going to say. My taxes went up, and he didn't file for an appeal, and he was mad, like a lot of people are. I'm actually helping someone right now, a guy that lives on Corby, and his um, taxes went way up. Well, he never filed an assessment or his uh, deduct homestead, and he was in the military, and he only makes thirty thousand dollars a year. My point is, I have I work with so many people that I see this constantly happening, and good luck figuring it out. But I'm just saying there, there is a problem, there really is, and it's it's 
for myself, it's just, it's very, uh, it's just very disheartening to see people. And I know it's they get a they get a form in the mail, it's on there. But I look at it in my eyes that I've been doing this a long time and I can read it. And I just wonder if there's a way we're not going to figure this out tonight. But if there's some way to make it easier for people to understand, I mean, the title companies have tried to help people by filing their exemptions, which I think was great. This guy used an attorney to transfer his house from his parents to him. So his attorney did not do that for him. I'm sorry if there's any attorneys here, but um, now I'll pick on my profession since Mike brought up the fact that you bought a house. And I, so I'm just saying there's a problem. I don't know how to solve it, but there really is a problem. And there's just a lot of people that have a hard time navigating, especially as they get older through this process. Don't ask me why, don't ask me how to fix it, but there is. And if there's a problem that exists, we have to look at it and try to solve it, I think. Um, Mike actually talked about if you bought your house and the assessment came and the assessment was lower than what you paid for it, that it, you may not be able to get your reduction in it. I would actually say that under some circumstances, that's actually not true. And I'll give you a perfect example of someone that, I have a friend that works um, at United Export and he works in the Middle East. And he called me and said, you don't want to do this, but I want you to help this person out. They're in um, Israel. This guy's mom bought a house and a seminar in Israel that was on Illinois Street. And they told her that she was going to be able to rent it to Notre Dame students. And it was very unfortunate because I went back and looked, and the house was listed for about $30,000. The realtors pulled it off. There was a group of realtors and investors that sold it to this person for $50,000. So I'm thinking to myself, I can't meet with them. They're in Israel, so what am I going to do? So I pulled up the assessments for the houses around it and the sales of what had just sold in that area. So I could share that with them and email it to them and go, look, the houses around you have sold for twenty-five dollars to $30,000. And they're actually, by the way, in better shape than yours. So I sent that to them. But what I looked at when I did that, and it's one of my pet peeves of doing this a long time, I always look at assessments. When, I'm, when I see houses, I look at what their assessment is. And all the houses were assessed, almost, not all of them, but a, a majority of them, probably 70%, were assessed higher than what the sales price was. And I'm like, well, that's kind of weird. It's an area that, you know, you think they should be a little lower. If you can give someone a break, give someone that lives in a $30,000 house a break. So I ended up selling the house for $18,000 and so had it. So the house was not worth what she paid for it. And I really believe in the last year, that's happened a whole lot in some areas. And I would say anything that's around Notre Dame, that might be the case. So. It doesn't happen a lot, but I do, do think it happens. And when I talk about assessments and why I look at them, one of my habits is whenever I see a house that's over a half million dollars, whether it's listed and comes to the MLS, I always look at the assessment. And it seems to me that a lot of houses that are more expensive are the ones that seem to be assessed less than the other ones. And again, I know you're new, but I'm just telling you what I've seen in 30 years of experience. And my experience is different than everybody in this room because you work for the city, con county, state, wh whoever you work for, but I work with the people that are out, let's call it in the trenches. And that, again, I don't only sell half million dollar houses. I work with people that are um, sometimes quite poor. I work with South Bend Heritage Foundation, and it's one of the people I love working for because we find, put people in houses that a lot of times can't. So that was just one thing I wanted to interject. Um, and one of the questions I have, so if I want to help her lower her taxes, because that's what I do for some people, if there's no sales for her home, can we just use then homes that we find and we have to search around there or what other assessments are? Because well, a lot of times it's like, well, it has to be a home that's sold in this time frame. So I look at, so, well, you brought up quite a few things. So, so let me, Sorry. <laughs> let me, uh, let me uh, jump back and then I'll answer that question sure. uh, for you. So yes, there are the anomalies in the market where individuals will pay sight unseen higher than what the property's worth. Yep. And, 
and I guess so the, the general statement that I made, there were some assumptions that you went through the normal route to purchase the property, the bank gave you an appraisal, and the assumption right. is it's going to be close or indicative to what the market value is. The appraisal was. Right. So th that, that there's some general assumptions there. So, yes, right. there are those anomalies where that happens. And, again, as I had said before, this is where the appeal process, you know, really becomes right. uh, important. Um, but then to, to jump back to the uh, – uh, uh, to the other question, I so typically the, the protocol had been before that the assessor would only look at sales within um, that year. Right. I I approach it a lot different. I'm bringing on board here uh, a multiple regression analysis program that looks at three years of sales, okay. and we can even go back five years. I I have the ability to time adjust for. Uh, um, you know, appreciation or depreciation of value based off of inflation and other things. Right. So we, if we we find those 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 um, instances where there were no sales in the neighborhood, I do have the resources to okay. be able to reach out and, and try to get a value for that. That makes it a whole lot easier helping people with their appeal because if you only can use in the past, only use sales and there's none. What do you do? Yeah, so this this is kind of how so Good. the state tells us we can do, that we have to use the cost approach, but I do like to look at sales outside of the normal window to try to okay. get an idea to help the taxpayer. One of the questions I don't know if anybody here lives in Green, but I have a person that works for me, and she lives in Green Township, and she asked me, and I have no clue. If you live in Green Township, which has moved away from South Bend schools, are they still going to be paying for South Bend schools even though they're in Green? Or John Glenn? Somebody correct me if I say this wrong, but I believe that green schools will still pay referendum taxes, uh, even though they've separated from South Bend schools, they will still pay referendum taxes because the voters voted for that for the remaining five years of the referendum, the operating referendum. Okay, and then it'll be done. All right. In my last closing, I, I talked to other people in other states um, about property taxes and taxes. I mean, I look at Indiana, we should learn what happened in Illinois. Because we, we should be really happy because guess who's coming to Indiana and Michigan? All the people from Illinois. So I think, the, and this isn't your job, I think this is the people downstate, if they're watching this, um, heed what's happened in Illinois. Because eventually if you raise the taxes, people are going to, well, I can go somewhere else. So I appreciate the time. It was a nice format to um, be able to voice people's opinion. And I learned some things. So thank you very much. Good evening, Tim Cotton, uh, Chair for the Libertarian Party, uh, resident of Green Township. Uh, just want to, you know, a couple, couple points that I want to, you know, put out to the crowd here. Um, Indiana Department of uh, Local Government Finance, uh, you'll find that at the indiana.gov website, actually has a very good uh, walk you through type of uh, citizen's guide to property tax assessment. Uh, there's a few PowerPoints there, some PDFs, but it'll, it'll walk you through your, your tax record card and, and show you how some of those calculations are made. So uh, it, it's a very good resource, what they, uh, what they put together down there. And uh, I went through that here a couple, couple years ago, and it really you know, helped me understand you know, how, you know, how the tax rates are set and then how the numbers actually play out on the cards. Um, so... Uh, one question here, uh, you know, Mike, first question that I told you I was going to ask, you know, is taxation theft? So the short answer, <laughs> the short answer to that is, uh, yes, taxation without representation is theft. Yeah, thank you very much, yes. Mike. Uh, so one of the questions that actually uh, occurred to me, uh, you know, talking about uh, New, Car uh, New Carlisle, um, if farmland is sold as agricultural, say a, a company comes in and, you know, buys we're going to buy this 40 acres and then we're going to rezone it. Whose property taxes does that affect? Does that affect and, and be applied to commercial taxes for, for that year? Or does that affect the, the residents, uh, you know, the, the farmers of that area that are zoned agricultural? You know, who, who takes the hit on that sale? Is that going to be the farmers or is that going to be the commercial properties? So uh, what's important to, to, to note here is there's no trending to agricultural land. 
So we're not, nobody gets a hit. The agricultural land values are derived downstate based off a five year cycle. Um, so until the intended use of that property changes, we just got in a comprehensive discussion about this. It, it doesn't change until the use of that property changes. So what defines the change of use is when they put a commercial structure on there. And then that would, would, get, would go to the commercial properties. And that has nothing to do with the residents or agricultural at all. Okay, so so thank you. That that it goes to you know completely to the homestead acreage itself, and and not the rest of it zoned agricultural. Right. Okay. Uh, my next question, you know, it you know comes down to you know market value ratio. You know, so you know I'm a, I'm an engineer. You know, I I like math. I play with the math. That you know market value is is what that value is that determines once we have the property tax rate assessed, what is our hit going to be? That, that market value ratio, I, my question is, how much leeway do you actually have on that ratio on assessing on property value? Because, you know, for instance, you know, my, my taxes have tripled in, in 10 years, which is relatively minor to a lot of people you know, in this room, but, you know, for me, one income family, you know, that's a large hit, you know, my mortgage has gone up a hundred dollars from the point where, you know, where I bought the house. But, you know, at the same time, you know, I don't have a no roof, you know, there's, you know, there's depreciation of the home, you know, yes, there, you know, you know, somebody may come in and, and want to buy that house for $200,000, but that doesn't mean that that house's true value is $200,000. The, the, the market value ratio doesn't take into account, you know, any, you know, any depreciation of value, and, and it's assuming that the assessed value increases every year. So that, that market value ratio is, 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 you know, chasing revenue instead of you know, chasing, you know, what is your actual value? So, so my question is, you know, how, what room do you have as, as county assessor have to play with the, with that market value ratio that, you know, fundamentally, you know, affects, here's our, here's our big chunk of cheese, how much is going to get shaved away? Okay, so I'm, I'm glad you asked this question. Um, so my colleagues are probably going to be quite teed off at me at, at the answer for this, but I don't agree with racial studies and never have. Uh, any time that you apply numbers to anything, it can be manipulated. And, and this is going to go into, you know, what leeway I have. Um, so let's talk about why the ratio study was ever brought into existence to begin with. So, you know, up until 2006, we were using 1999 cost tables to cost out your property. And so the state said, hey, wait a second, we're seeing a rise in the assessment in the market. We need to have a methodology that goes back to prior to 1999. How do we adjust, the, you know, how do we adjust the market? And so the assessor is responsible for looking at all sales in a particular neighborhood. And in that leeway, our responsibility is to, is to pull out anomalies or outliers that wouldn't fit in the normal uh, data set of, of what's normal for that market. So let me give you an example. If I'm looking at a subdivision, let, let's, let's say uh, that has $200,000 homes and then they add on an additional subdivision and those homes are 600,000 in the back, then the leeway for the assessor is he can do two things. One, he could put them in two separate neighborhoods and do their own racial studies or for the case that there isn't that, then we can do, then we can extract them from the study because they're not the norm of the entire uh, ratio. This is where I have problems with my colleagues because there's no defined set of how many numbers I can extract from, from the study. And so you'll see uh, some of my colleagues extract it to the point where they don't have to do a study at all. And then what happens is that as we get down the line, eventually there will be enough cells, and then all of a sudden you see this huge spike in, in, in trending because they didn't trend all along when it was, when it was required. Uh, so there is a, a, a large amount of leeway, and I think when we look at neighborhoods, one of the things we try to do is try to look at is, is the trending indicative to what we're seeing the cells? 
And if it's not, do we need to do a more uh, finite uh, uh, trending or ratio study? In other words, do we need to separate two stories from one stories? Do we need to look at just agricultural homes? And so again, and you're going to hear me say appeal, 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 appeal. And the reason why I say that is because in the appeal process, I'm taking notes, and this is when I see those issues in those neighborhoods, and then I can go back to the reassessment process to say, hey, was it through trending? If there was, then let's figure out why. And so there is a great amount of latitude that the assessor has, and if you listen to the DLGF, they'll say, we give a great amount of deference to the local governing body. So there's a great amount, the answer to that is there's a great amount of leeway uh, for me. But the goal is to ensure that the taxpayers are all being equally assessed in the same manner. Okay, thank you. Yep. Finally. Mine's not as technical as all theirs. <laughs> <laughs> I took notes and I didn't take good notes. My name is Emily. Um, so all I want to know is the property record form. Do I go to the assessor or do I go to the auditor? So for the property record card, I would tell you to go to the assessor's office. Okay. Um, so the, there is an online version of it, oh. but the problem with the online version is it may not be have the current data because they, we have to we have to uh, do all the trending and it takes a time period for our oper or for our camera system to put it out. So I would tell you the most relying uh, or the most reliable uh, property record card would be the one you get from the assessor's office. Okay. And are you still accepting appeals for this year? No. So the no. deadline. No matter what anybody does. So unfortunately, do that. that's why I stressed. And I pulled up the Form 11, and I right. said in big, bold letters, you have 45 days from the time I send that out. I was a day late. So <laughs> you're going to receive, we're sending out actually tomorrow, the uh, Form 11s are going out. So you can file, just because you missed it this year, you don't need to wait till you receive your Form 11. You want to file an appeal, you can file an appeal tonight. My staff is standing by. If you want to file an appeal, we'll take that from you. Um, that would be for next year. So unfortunately, the state is really uh, clear on the time frame for which we can, we can accept appeals. Okay. And so, like, I have not done anything to my house. Like, no additions, no nothing. But my neighbors have. So their improvements has affected my taxes. Correct? Well, so yes and no. Uh, so this is where the system gets kind of complicated, and this is why training in the assessor's office is paramount to ensuring us fair assessments. When a, sales, uh, when a property is sold, you're required to do a sales disclosure by law. This opens the window for the assessor, it gives us 60 days to look at uh, the sale and figure out whether or not it's valid. And so what's great about properties being online, they put MLS books pictures online to allow us to look into the home. So we can't go into the home. So if they made improvements, we can see those improvements, then we make adjustments within that 60 days. Um, so if those improvements of those, so we see in, it, we go through the appeal process and I say, hey, there's some issues in this neighborhood and we start seeing, we go back to the cells and we see that it was because of improvements, then we make the adjustment or I will make the adjustment as we go into the reassessment. But what you're really seeing in today's market is there is a low supply of homes and properties are selling, there's not enough, and so they're selling for more and that's why you're seeing your property values go up. And that's, that's something that, you know, uh, I don't think anybody can control because there's a lack of supply for, of homes. Okay, and the 65-year-old cap, whatever, mm -hmm. do you have to call and tell people that you're 65? <laughs> I'm well over 65. Well, so. you have to come um, into our office is the easiest way because you have to um, bring documentation in to show us your income because there's income limits for that. Okay. So we need to see like your federal tax return if you file taxes because we have to check the adjusted gross income line to see single person has to- Can you to tell me what that is or no? 30,000 for if you file individually and 40,000 if it, you file jointly. So widow is so, individual. Yeah, so you just look at that adjusted gross income line and that's what we're gonna look at. So as long as you don't make more than 30,000 and you're 65 and your house is paid off? 
No, it doesn't matter about if your house is paid okay. off. It's the assessed value. Okay. As long as the assessed value is under the threshold, which I believe is 240000 right now. Okay. And how many years is that? Does it have to be there before you can apply? Have to be there? I don't understand your question. I'm sorry. We have to see two years of your tax returns. I'm sorry. And you have to be 65 like the year before. So like last year, if you turned 65 last year, then you can come in this year Six years ago. with your 20, 2022 and 2021 federal tax returns to show us that your adjusted gross income is below that threshold. And just to answer that lady's your question, I don't want to give you a heart attack. But about 30 years ago, so you can't blame these people, we did not have an escrow account, my husband and I. We had to pay our taxes. We both lost our jobs. We did not pay our taxes. Our house went into the sheriff's tax cell. And so to get it back, we had to pay the person that bought our house like $15,000. And we added that on to, because that's what they bought my house for. I owed whatever it was, or $1,000, let's say, property tax, which we did not pay, our fault, but they got our house in a bid for 15000 We had to pay that to keep our house. Just so you know, I don't know if those laws have changed, but my loan No, yeah. Yeah, those laws are the same. So, I mean, if it's a share of sale would be if you don't pay your mortgage payments and the mortgage company is going to sell it on share of sale. Tax sale is if you're three installments behind, then you can go up for tax sale. And unfortunately, we have a lot of big investors that like to come in on the tax sales and overpay on the properties. And that's what I think she's referring to because then you have a chance, you have a period that you can redeem your property if it was sold at tax sale, but you have to pay extra to pay because those, um, to reimburse the um, buyer an interest rate per day on their money that they overpaid when they bought your house, so. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Ramon Johnson. I do reside in South Bend. And I'm also here on behalf of South Bend Community School Corporation. Uh, just real quick, can you tell me uh, the effect uh, that the referendum has had on people's property taxes? Maybe in a monetary amount, monetary way. Which one is it, 1.27? South Bend Clyde. Here's what I can tell you. For a person who has a home in the South Bend school system, I'm only going to pull out the referendum piece, so that's 0 .33, 0 .0639. <clears throat> that person is going to pay 1.4%. So the circuit breaker caps are 1%, 2%, and 3%, so a homeowner is only going to pay 1% of their value. But because of the referendum, a homeowner in the South Bend school district is going to pay 1.4% on their circuit breaker cap because they're going to pay 0.4 for the referendum operating referendum debt. So $100,000 house, instead of paying $1,000, pay $1,400. Make sense? It does. It does. Thank you. So I see we have, uh, if we don't have any other questions from the audience, we do have people online. Uh, is there any questions from the people that are uh, with us online? Okay, not seeing anything. Uh, we appreciate you guys giving us the opportunity to come out and talk to you. Uh, I will stick around if you have any one-on-one uh, -on -one questions. My staff is here if you want to file appeals. Uh, and certainly uh, we're, we're there, you know, Monday through Friday if you have any additional questions. So thank you for your time. Well, so yeah, so. Right, but you can always come in and submit because you're ahead of the game.